Hello and thank you for watching. Today we are going to discuss the power of internationalization in digital marketing, which is no longer an option for those businesses wishing to trade successfully in international markets. This is because um, in today's interconnected world, it is key to learn about the uh, power of uh, internationalization, how the, the role that it plays, the um, cultural sensitivities that we need to deal with on an everyday basis on, it, on each international market, if you want to be successful. So let's embark on this journey together. And for this reason, we've got here Perus Canconitano, who is a multilingual SEO consultant and also a fellow woman tech maker ambassador. Hello, Veruska. Hello. How are you? Hello, hello. I'm good. How are you, Monse? I am very well, thank you. I'm very, very excited about today's conversation. It's one of my favorite topics. So, for the benefit of those in the audience who don't know you, could you describe yourself and what you do? Yes, I'm going to put it simple because it's pretty hard to understand what I do since uh, I don't do traditional uh, SEO and I don't do traditional localization. I do and multilingual SEO and globalization. So putting it simple, what I do, I help company, uh, companies deciding whether to enter in specific markets. So I don't work worldwide. I only work in specific markets. And when, when they decide to enter or if they are already in the market, how to scale and be successful. The, um, I'm usually the person that basically is in charge of helping teams talk to each other. Mm -hmm. So SEO talks to uh, localization, SEO talks to international UX or, or vice versa, uh, but also talking to with uh, VIPs uh, to make them buy the process or make them scale down when it's necessary. And I'm always the person in charge of the strategy. And the, the, the how do you say, Probably the, the peculiarity of my approach is that I have a, I don't have a tech background at all. I have a sociology and social linguistics background, mm -hmm. which uh, I then supplemented uh, with uh, other masters and things uh, in data. So my approach uh, is completely sociological and social linguistical. So I don't because I don't see any other way to do internationalization without taking into account uh, the sociological part of things that goes uh, the opposite way um, compared to the psychological way. But that's another topic. <laughs> so what does it involve, really, for those who are not... I, I, by the way, I agree with, you, with your approach. I think it's, it's a very um, accurate one. But uh, for those people and businesses out there who don't know what it involves, could you explain that? Yes. So uh, we are used to do, let, let's put it again simple. We are used to do SEO by looking at a set of keywords uh, or finding the most important keywords for a given market. But mm -hmm. in today's world, uh, in reality, even in the past, to be honest, Focusing on keywords that have a uh, high ranking, uh, it doesn't guarantee success no. because they, they can have high ranking for a specific reason uh, that is related to a specific uh, sociological context uh, within a certain country. So if we don't know what's happening in a country, if we don't know what are the background of that country culturally, if we don't know the implication of what's happening, what happens in the past, uh, the language used, uh, we cannot actually select the keywords that will convert. So the approach I use is exactly this. Know the market, not just, uh, well, you know, um, this keyword has a thousand um, volumes per, per month. So it means that it will definitely and for sure bring money. It's not a direct relationship because uh, the, the reason why certain keywords uh, have certain volumes uh, is because something is happening, is because something happened in the past, is because people search in a, search, in a certain way based on the language that they use, which is not just exactly the language, but the structure that they use as well. So the sociological approach and social linguistics approach that I adopt uh, is basically this, matching uh, the cultural background with 
the search intent with the volumes uh, with then the the ult- with the ultimate goal of making money to be honest there is no other way of putting this at the end goal of making money and or become known in a given market so i don't know if it's much more clear yeah 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 no definitely that probably means as well just choosing keywords that don't have much volume or even zero volume simply because they are much more related to business and to business in that specific target market am i right absolutely Absolutely. I actually, one of the things that I do a lot uh, in working with zero volume keywords, uh, which are the keywords that you won't think about or very little volume, but that have potential because they are tied up with a specific market and a specific business. But sometimes they also are tied up to a specific event in a specific place Mm -hmm. that may not make sense and usually don't make sense globally, but it makes sense for a specific market. They don't have much volume because there are a lot of other factors that um, comes when it, when, it, when it comes to keyword volumes. Uh, you know, sometimes tools are not even able to understand yeah. the real value or the real volumes uh, because they are so specific that if we don't, when we expand from english speaking markets uh, the the, the 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 landscape is completely different even when it comes to tools so something that a tool can tell us uh, as 10 search volumes per month maybe as 1000 and we don't know but maybe with a 10 volume per month that can actually bring a lot of money a lot of business oh, yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly it becomes- it's at the end of the day, you need the goal is to bring something to the business. That's something. Uh, if you have ten people searching for that specific things, they already know that they want that things that you can provide. So you win them easily, mm-hmm. and they become your recurrent, recurring clients, customer, recommend you. So it's the way you you actually move from being one of the brands to being their brand in people's mind in that specific segment, in that specific market. I remember this, someone gave this um, this example um, while working in France. And basically they used pictures, they used graphics, and they tried to um, attract um, business and uh, traffic with different types of pictures so they've got like, they had like the uh, the normal one the like the regular one for the whole of the campaign and then they used a picture for north france and a different picture from the south of france and guess what each of these very specific types of pictures attracted a lot more traffic and a lot more leads than the general picture <laughs> yes but i mean if you think, if you put yourself uh, in the eyes of a consumer, of a user who is searching and land on your page, uh, what does entice you? A picture that you recognize of something that you recognize uh, or a more generic one that it basically speaks to the whole population? I, for example, uh, I'm from Rome. If uh, I search for something related to food, mm-hmm. I expect to food from Italy, I expect to see food from Italy. But if I search for something that is more specific to my region, I want to see something that is specific to my region. And that's, that's a huge, that, that's why, yes, I totally agree. I work on something like this, to be honest, and a project like this for a big company where we decided to um, enter one market uh, using visuals as well and using different visuals for different uh, parts of the country. because. You know, the expectation I have on uh, what I look for pasta is different uh, from the expectation some from, I don't know, Venice as when they look for pasta. So I want to be served uh, on what I expect to see and they have to, they, they want to be served with what they have expect basically so yeah it is it is really powerful and the more and that's that's something that it's happening more and more often uh, hyper personalization of the experience in international yeah. markets so you have a global uh, a market and then you segment 
deep down and niche down so much that you basically create these small communities within the, globe, the big market. And this is basically because a customer uh, behavior is changing as well with all the technology that we all have in our hands. We all know how to upload uh, content on Facebook, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, and everything else that comes, that comes with it, right? So we are not expecting the same thing all of the time. We are not trying, trying to, we're not expecting the same type of content for campaigns or websites, uh, uh, mobile applications, for example, et cetera, et cetera. We are, we are trying to get something unique, perhaps a unique experience. So I always say that I could drink a beer at home. That's not a problem. But if I go out and drink that beer is because I want to feel the experience of that place. Yes, totally. And people are also changing the way they search. Yes. So they search more specifically for what they need. And sometimes, so there's a two way around. So sometimes they search for very specific things. Other times they don't. So it's up to you that know the market to understand why they are searching in that specific moment, in that specific way mm -hmm. they may not even know that they are searching for something uh, because something happened to them or in the place that they live that's something that happened a lot during the pandemic people starting and it actually not at, um, during the pandemic but when the the war in ukraine uh, exploded basically which is not the, the best term but whatever <laughs> Well, it started. <laughs> started. Um, so uh, people in certain countries in Europe started to search for more ways to cook at home, to use food, uh, simple food. And nobody knew, well, actually, on a very high level, superficial level, you may just say, oh, people have found a renewed interest uh, after the pandemic to cook at home. But the truth was different. People started to feel the, to fear the war and mm -hmm. says, what happens uh, if there's no food? I need to know how to use more flowers to make things at home. I need to know how to make the most out of, uh, I don't know, tomatoes. Because that something can happen. And if you match this uh, thing uh, with uh, the spike uh, in saving cards uh, for supermarkets, it's clear. The trend was clear. Mm -hmm. Something was happening that was affecting those people in that specific market. Uh, I saw this in Spain, in Italy, yeah. Portugal, Greece. Uh, and they reacted by searching for trivial things without probably even knowing why they were looking for those things. But there was a match because then there was this spike on saving cards of points cards from supermarket coupons and stuff like this. So you do one plus one, it's two. So people are fearing something, something is happening, something is happening that is affecting the, their country. That's why this is happening. So there's much more than just saying it's changing, it's changing the behavior. And sometimes we don't know. So there are a lot of things why people search in a certain way in certain markets in a specific time frame. And now Google has realized that and they are testing SGE, search generative experience, and, and see what it does really, <laughs> because it is poised to change quite radically the way we actually search or users search. Yes, totally. I still don't see, I'm still trying to understand how it will change because for us, for the, the, play, the markets I work for, it really, it's not affecting and it's not appearing yet. So it's just like spotting or spying on what's happening in the US mostly. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there will be a change in search, but also it's, it will be an opportunity for international business to really shy when it comes to specific content. So people uh, yeah. won't stop uh, at the results that uh, SG will give them. They will scroll, uh, but they need to find something more meaningful to them. It's not more having a generic landing page or on whatever, sneakers, white sneakers. Uh, it's going to be 
it needs to be way more specific. Otherwise, results will go on SG and people will just stop there and they will have all the answers. So it's it's really the time to niche down. And that's something that I will keep saying to everybody, niche down uh, as businesses and niche down uh, professionally. Because that's the only way to survive uh, with all these changes, the algorithm, SG, a lot of people um, working on the same things at the same time. And providing the same type of products and services, exactly. which always happens. And I, what I always say is just look inside, audit what you've got, see see what you have and uh, see what, what you have to fix, but also what you have to build up on and do this um, I do this frequently because I think that a lot of the times we kind of overlook what's in front of us, whether it is good or whether it is not that good. And that yes. has, um, that, 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 that becomes more important when it, when it gets to, um, international markets, particularly those markets that, uh, that are, well, to, to us uh, are more complicated, more exotic, perhaps, right? Such as yes. APAC, such as Japan. I remember working in the Japanese market. Uh, that was totally different from what I had expected, or the, from what I had experienced. Mm -hmm. And that was eye-opening, really. Things were really complicated. But I, but I think you, you do work in APAC markets, I think. Yes. Right? Yeah. Yes, it's complicated and the complication starts from the language. Mm. Because the way they search and the reason why AI is kind of failing in that space in Japan, in South Korea, in China, it's not even accessible, but whatever. Um, it's because the language, for example, they don't have spaces. Mm. So they search for everything in once uh, and that's why ai cannot produce results that are good and that's why probably google will have to adapt to, to this as well and that's why a lot of japanese ai companies are developing their models because that's the only way to understand so everything starts from uh, the structure of the language which affects how they search uh, but also the the order of the word, but also from a very cultural perspective, what do they expect? Like I remember doing something uh, when, when you do work with South Korea in the beauty industry, for example, uh -huh. there is this strange, strange term that I came to understand after a long time that is whitening cream. Uh -huh. The whitening cream, as we Western people understand, it is something that kind of make you white, easy, easy as it is. The way they search is whitening cream is something that is, is a moisturizer. Okay. So they expect to see products that moisturize your skin and make it and kind of cancer, get the blemish goes away, but it doesn't really make your skin white uh, you don't change the color of your skin it doesn't uh, it has a completely different meaning but when they search for this kind of things uh, which is uh, extremely extremely valuable and it's also one of the most searched things they also expect to see images that reflect this they expect to to have to um to see how the products uh, uh works the, uh, it's called the swap. Mm -hmm. So basically, they expect to see how in different tones, skin tones, the, the cream uh, works. What's the result? Uh, they want visuals. Visuals are extremely important uh, in APAC and SEOs, uh, reality digital marketers uh, that don't take this into account fail big, fail big. Because if you go, for example, to a website, web, Japanese website, it's a very... Very often you find a block of text, a lot of, lot of text. But then you have uh, these visuals that help them understand concepts better. Very often they reflect in Japan, very often they are manga style, which is not something that you, you may think that's manga is something for Western people. It's not. 
it's part of their culture. So I had a business that they wanted to expand there and they decided uh, I will adopt the same exact um, strategy that I've been using uh, in UK. And it didn't work. The moment that we start using uh, way more text, heavy text with a lot of information and then put some very nice visual with the colors that we knew that were going to be rocking there, the conversion spikes spiked. So there is a, that's what it is, cultural sensitivity. It's understanding how to how people perceive things and how not to offend them. But this works for every market. Like, like if you use certain colors in certain markets, uh, you are offending them. So you should be aware that certain colors means death. Certain colors means bad luck. Mm -hmm. Other colors uh, in APAC, uh, red, for example, in many APAC markets means lucky and it's specifically used in specific months and for specific content. So there's a lot, a lot going on in this, in, in this, uh, but it's, it's, yeah, it's fasc fascinating to be honest. It's really, really, really fascinating. It really is fascinating because what you are telling me is, is, is very different from what many of us will have experienced in other markets. Definitely. So white and Korean. Uh, which is being searched for as in a, a moisturizer, <laughs> which is nothing. It is. <laughs> it is. It is. And for concept. me, it was like, it is, it, it, it is exactly. It's a concept. But I can give you another example, uh, which is uh, much more close to us. Uh, like, uh, um, this is very, very weird. Uh, but that's really talk about what is cultural sensitivity and how in reality internationalization is not just. Uh, finding keywords uh, and it goes uh, two ways uh, it goes before launch and after launch uh, and it's not something that seos do it's mm -hmm. it's something else it's an ecosystem uh, years ago there was this company in italy and a very local company very well known company well known famous they do amazing cookies uh, so like like every single person now from Rome knows this company. I love them super. I really, really, really love them. So they came out with these cookies that are were with uh, uh, nuts. Mm -hmm. Super good, super like buttery, just amazing. Uh, and like you say, ah, this is something that I want. But what did they do? They used the unnaming that resembled the fastest time. That's it. <laughs> so, so what happened, what happened is that, uh, um, at first, uh, very little, very few people and kind of connected, not, they, they didn't even connect it or they found something strange, something like, this is not really, I don't know, there's something wrong with this. <laughs> and then more and more people started to say, this is wrong. This is wrong. This is an insult to the people that for the time, this is a very, very sensitive thing for Italians. And especially in a place like Roma, where there's a big, well, I'm not going into politics, but there's big polarization between the political parties. Yeah. And so more and more people started to just look down at this, uh, at the point that they didn't sell at all. They were delicious, trust me, delicious. They didn't sell. And they had to stop the production, change the name, go for something that sh surely is blind, uh, more blind, more, more, you know, um, easy, but even less appealing, probably in terms of naming. But this make, made them uh, appropriate for the market. Yeah. So that's there are very different levels of sensitivity, what people expect, uh, what the, our culture uh, wants us to expect and, and, and all of these things needs to be taken into consideration because even if you have a naming that is wrong, uh, try to do SEO for something that is as a name that is so wrong that you feel bad doing it and you feel bad when you see advertising or organic results. 
Yeah, politics is something that um, brands need to take into account. Uh, I have this um, example from Walmart uh, trying to branch out in Italy. And no, it wasn't in Italy, it was in Germany. And yeah. the problem is that they did it in a way that reminded Germans of times past. And uh, obviously they had to close down, they had to change everything that they had previously done, costing them millions probably, and costing them their brand name too. So it is worth going well beyond SEO, well beyond marketing even, right? Just to think about all the different nuances, all the different um, uh, bits and pieces that they may actually can uh, find in the uh, and yeah. in every market. It's not just politics. It's, it can be, um, I don't know, different approach to holidaying, for example, different approach to um, to, to family, for example. I know in, in Spain, family, the concept of family is predominant. It, it really is very important one, very important concept. And brands, Weave it in the into their um into their marketing simply because it, it does sell it does sell it gives trust so it's something something to bear in mind too yep definitely yes that's absolutely completely agree so can you tell us if there's any emerging trends within the um within the internationalization uh, business? <laughs> I, I know that everyone is keep saying the same thing, but I don't see it as a trend. It is just the talk of the day because in my role, I've been, it's AI, mm -hmm. but in my role, I've been dealing with AI for years. And now everybody's talking about AI and it's becoming more mainstream. But when you go to internationalization, AI has always been there. In one way or another, it's always been there. Whether it is uh, machine translation, uh, whether it uh, is uh, language uh, um, assistance uh, for dealing with other languages, whatever. But it's always the, been there. The thing that it is a trend is how fast is scaling in other fields that affects uh, internationalization. Um, like everybody, Every single company, every single person uh, thinks that using, uh, and I'm doing a very trivial example, ChatGPT to translate a website. So I'm already seeing a yeah. lot, a lot of websites entering a marketing a market and failing the approach because it just says, I put everything in there, I get the translation, I'm done. Hmm. And that's uh, the, the trend uh, that is not as positive as it should be because. Uh, AI and uh, automatization, uh, machine learning uh, are huge and helpful, um, but you need to know how to use it. And what's happening is that with those tools becoming extremely cheap first, mm -hmm. extremely affordable with a very, very apparently very, 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 very easy learning cur curve, which is only apparent. I think you spoke with Andrea about this as well. Mm -hmm. The learning curve for AI is not as easy as it seems, uh, but uh, all these uh, fast and cheap uh, tools uh, may make it seem so easy to use that everybody's using it. It's actually bringing a lot of noise and it's costing business a lot of money because what a machine can do is only part of what humans can do. So the only way to take advantage of this and use it as a trend uh, is to be aware of the complication, uh, be aware of how to use it, uh, and to minimize the risk of spending too much and not getting anything. I'm a, I I I don't know why, but I see a lot of a lot of people and companies asking to rectify what AI. So I'm yes. getting a lot of requests in in, in this sense, and. And I think that's that's the, the downside of something that is in here, that's been in here for a very, very long time, but it's now becoming like everything that becomes mainstream, you know, that then gets, you know, change. It seems to change the way that things are done in a bad way. 
So that's the biggest trend that I see now in internationalization. And another thing is that I don't know if we are there yet, but more and more companies are understanding the needs for data. Yeah. Which means in the past, uh, you want it to be there. You saw that there was a, a you, the US market, and then you saw that there was an opportunity in UK for whatever reason, sometimes even just because they spoke the same language, or uh, Mexican, Spanish, uh, Spain, uh, Argentina, all the um, Spanish-speaking countries, it was seen as an opportunity. Now companies are moving to a different phase. We are kind of in a economical crisis, not kind of, we are in a crisis. Yeah. Uh, so everyone wants to be mindful. So you need to have data, more and more data to reinforce, uh, should I really go into that market? Uh, is it really worth it? Uh, but even uh, if, because sometimes uh, we get focused too much on volumes and those volumes don't bring anything. So I think data is really, really, really an emerging trend. We are not there yet, I think. Especially for more of what are considered easy markets. Um, but a lot of companies are moving uh, into, are starting to realize they cannot move internationally without doing market research first, uh, which has been neglected for so many years, uh, without considering CX, uh, which has always been there, but it's been, I don't know, put. It's been high for so long, like I, I, companies don't offering shippings in a specific country, but translating the website for that specific language doesn't make any sense. But even proper scouting, what works, what does it work, what people expect, what people search, how do they search? So I think finally we are getting in a position where companies don't want to be just in a market, they want to be meaningful uh, present uh, in a market like once uh, it was just i was i want to be there now is i want to be there with a precise goal in mind which is actually very good because a lot of the times you work uh, as an seo or as a digital marketer on a specific market but then uh, they just want to cover everything every single segment in every single uh, in every single market because what is important is that people actually just see them i think with data is that we are now starting to learn how to use it properly because uh, there, there was an explosion <laughs> with with data um, everybody wanted data and it's not something that it hasn't been done before but it became more mainstream i think just like ai or ai tools and uh, I think more and more people started to kind of handle all the data, but we didn't know exactly how to do it, how to do it. And also, um, this includes the fact that many people wanted to use the data for, um, you know, to, to, to get their, their own feelings validated whether they were right or whether they were not, rather than just going into the data and, and see what they could find. And that could be positive sure. or negative, but they just they just wanted to validate their, their, their feelings. And this is something that perhaps we are kind of moving away from um, slowly. <laughs> yes. And that Finally. affects a little bit of internationalization. <laughs> Right. Yeah. So, uh, Stuart, would you would you like to offer any advice, any final remarks for anyone uh, wanting to internationalize or work in internationalization? Yes. Yes or no? I mean, <laughs> I always feel extremely weird when I give advice or just tell people what to do and what not to do. Probably to think the first thing is for businesses or even consultants offering this. Too many companies uh, are jumping on the bandwagon just because it seems easy. Because uh, with the tools, uh, because uh, you see someone else doing this, so you just say, I can do this. It's uh, very it's easy. easy. Yeah. It's not easy. It involves taking into consideration so many things, involving so many people, and sometimes it's not worth it. I, I, I published that sometimes it's not even worth it uh, uh, collaborating between collaboration between teams 
Mm. So you need to really sit down and say, is, is this the right move? Do I have the data? Do, can I support the final user from the very beginning to the very end and post post and experience? Can I do? If I can't, if even the slightest, there's as slightest possibilities that you cannot do it, stop it immediately because it's a waste of money, time, resources, and brand. So that's the very first advice. And the second one is one of the biggest mistakes that I've seen, I keep seeing and I keep saying, and I keep training people, companies, individuals, and it comes both from companies, consultants, and also in-house people, is the misconception that having someone who knows one language more more than one language, so their mother tongue and another language, or even more than one, it's enough to expand internationally. Uh, it's, it's not. not. <laughs> it really is it not. Keeps, it takes way more. It takes way more skills. It takes uh, soft skills, hard skills. Uh, it takes uh, a lot of experience. I, and it's not just because that's what I do. I'm selling a, a genius. No. It's just that it is so easy to just say, okay, um, Veruska knows English and Italian now, let's say. And so she can help us expanding in Italy because she knows it's not it's not a direct relationship. It takes way more. It takes uh, project management skills. Yeah. It takes negotiation skills. It takes uh, a strong background uh, in, uh, um, in specific studies. It takes data. It takes a lot, a lot of things. So knowing the language and something that I've been struggling with, to let people understand and I'm actually training someone, a company right now, is that people are coming out of translation school are great, but they are not the people you go when you go to internationalization. No, not. They are part of the process because they will help you translate, but they are not the people that can handle this. So uh, it, it is necessary to understand that knowing more than one language doesn't guarantee success uh, because there's again a lot, a lot of things, and when you when you internationalize, you need to move from the idea to its execution, and then iterate, and that's the hardest part. And without the the basics, you won't succeed. You waste so much money, time, everything, and you it, it's just not worth it. Yeah, in fact, one of the biggest skills that I I can actually see when working, when working internationally is project management because there are so many bits and pieces that you need to actually put together and uh, the objective, uh, you have to actually identify what needs you need to meet, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And there's so many bits and pieces and I don't really think that many teams or many businesses actually can see this. So yeah, a translator, you, you definitely need a translator to localize from language to another but that is only as you say part of the process absolutely yeah there's yes, too many different yes, bits and pieces <laughs> absolutely and you need people that owns every little bit of p and p's yes that are reliable for that specific part and someone that overlooks so that's something that still uh, at least in the markets uh, and for the niches I work for, it's something that it's really, really, really hard to sell. Um, and just it takes a lot of time uh, to just uh, proper get companies, VIPs, people, uh, even other teams to understand that you are, you are part of something diff something more. Mm -hmm. So you can do what you want, but there are more pieces that are is a puzzle. Yeah, and this is where collaboration actually comes in. It's really important within management, within managing any project, um, an international project. You really need to collaborate with the different people because you may be knowledgeable of the German market, say, or the um, Japanese market, but then maybe within the remit of your current role, you can't really do you can really get to know all the bits and pieces that are necessary right now because something might be happening right now which you don't know. Just collaborate with people who actually do know uh, 
uh, the rest of the team, the extended teams within the company, et cetera, et cetera. That's, that's key. So my last question to you, just kind of moving away from international SEO, digital marketing and everything, what did you do to switch off? I hear you're a professional pit oh. sighter. <laughs> yes, I am. I, so I've been working as a consultant for forever. So uh, more than 20 years. Uh, and at first, uh, I didn't switch off at the beginning because I was constantly in a rush. Then I, I kind of made up my mind and said, I need to close everything, close the room and just get off the way of everything else. And what I do, I do quite a lot of sports. I run, I play tennis, I climb, but that's the thing that really kind of, you know, Help me recharge and also help me. I am so focused, especially when I run or playing that I cannot, I, I cannot think to anything else. It's just like letting it go. And uh, I do watch a lot of TV and movies as well. It's just something that kind of relax me and I eat pizza, eat and make pizza. So that's probably <laughs> the, the best part of it, to be honest. So. <laughs> I think you are a big fan of a Netflix program called One Piece or The One Piece. Yeah, I love mangas. So I read uh -huh. manga, watch anime. So it's like part of what watching TV and reading it is. <laughs> so I, it's just like this. I always say that it would be, I, I, I made a, I should have made an effort to work more on mangas than I do. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's it's part of what I like. <laughs> oh, excellent. Thank you so much, Veruska, for all your insights and your advice on internationalization. Hopefully, uh, everybody uh, will have seen this as really useful because I think it's really, really useful. And, uh, well, thank you very much for coming on the show today. Thank you so much for having me. It was so fun. And, yeah, if anyone wants to connect, let's connect on LinkedIn. Let's connect. Uh, I will, I will um, definitely uh, publish your, um, your LinkedIn um, so that people can find you. And uh, thank you so much and have a lovely rest of the day. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Bye.